It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. On today's show today, we've got two outstanding global leaders in supply chain. We're going to be talking a lot about leadership. We're going to be talking a lot about some of the most pressing business challenges in the world today. So stay tuned as we look to increase your supply chain leadership IQ. On a quick programming note, hey, if you, if you enjoy today's uh, interview, be sure to check out our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single thing. I want to welcome in my fearless, esteemed co-host today, Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur and trusted advisor to all. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. We are truly global today, aren't we? We are. I mean, we, uh, we're, keeping, we're keeping folks up late, getting them up early. Uh, it, it's incredible working across these time zones to, yeah. you know, to get all these perspectives. It's part of your efforts at delivering on being a supply chain adjutant, right? I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> Ask everyone. That's right. Well, let, with no further ado, let's welcome in our yeah. future guest here today. Really excited about today's conversation. We have Dominique Zwinkels, Executive Manager for People That Deliver, which is an organization we're going to learn a lot more about. It's allied with UNICEF, which everybody's heard of, of course. Right. And our dear friend, Jenny Froome, Chief Operating Officer with SAPIX, which is doing some big things in Africa and beyond when it comes to supply chain. So good morning, Dominique and Jenny. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having us. You bet. Uh, well, Dominique, your ears probably have been burning because Jenny was, was singing your praises earlier this week. So we look forward to learning a lot more about you. Yeah. And of course, our listeners have heard from Jenny before and learned more about SAPIX. It's always a pleasure. Um, this interview today comes on the heels of our third edition, our Eastern Hemisphere edition of our supply chain trivia match, which uh, was, was as fun as hell, guys. I, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, it was a time in these challenging times where you can kind of take a step back from the edge and just enjoy company for an hour, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It was great fun. All right. So let's get to know uh, you both a little better. Dominique, we're going to start <laughs> with you. So tell us, you know, where are you from and, and give us an anecdote or two about your upbringing. Sure. Um, so actually I was born in the Netherlands. Um, I am, I have a Dutch passport and a U.S. passport. Um, and when, but when I was two years old, I moved down to uh, South America and lived in a number of different countries, uh, Peru, then Colombia, and then Venezuela. And, um, uh, went back to Holland at some point when I was 16 and finished high school there and then came to the U.S. Uh, when I was, uh, let me think, I was 23, 24. Wow. Um, and then wow. I stayed. <laughs> it was really the, it was the work. And of course, I met my husband. Um, and then I stayed. And uh, I basically have a, um, for the past 23 years, I've been working in international development, um, in, in uh, nutrition, food security, strategic planning, both at sort of uh, small NGOs, nonprofit organizations, as well as uh, um, sort of larger multilateral organizations. Um, but now for the past 13 years in health supply chain management. Really? Wow. Yeah. And, and we've seen uh, a lot of a lot of innovation yeah. in that space, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, prior to my current job, um, I worked uh, for, on the HIV AIDS supply chain um, with uh, John Snow International at the Partnership for Supply Chain Management, and uh, where we procured and uh, delivered essential life-saving medicines for the HIV AIDS programs that are funded by the US government um, all over the world. So there, there's a lot of innovation that you've seen through that program. Um, sadly, it ended uh, there in sort of uh, 2015, 2016, but then I got this wonderful opportunity to move on and be the executive manager for the people that deliver. So, and that's, yeah, that's what I do now, but I'll tell you a little bit more about people that live in a bit. That's Absolutely. not much, is it? A world traveler. <laughs> if I counted right, you lived in something like five or six countries by the time you were 16. Is that 
Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I did. That was, uh, those formative years really made me who I am. That's why, you know, I actually have an MBA and I, uh, but I never actually worked in private business. I wow. sort of just went off to doing more of this international development work. Which is, is, is absolutely critical. And, yeah. uh, but I'm very jealous of the international experience you had in those formative years. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's got to be such an advantage, especially in this day and age where business is global. It'll always be global moving forward. And of course, supply chain is global. So uh, yeah. we look forward to dive more into that experience here momentarily, Dominique. Yeah, thank you. All right. So Jenny, uh, our listeners should be familiar. You, you came on and, and, and we interviewed you about it. it it's been about a year ago. I don't know if you, yeah. it, that sounds about right. I yeah. believe it. Um, yeah. it was pre me. I know that. <laughs> so this is, I'm really dying to hear this. So <laughs> let's and hear that, it. It's and that's really, not that exciting. that's really how we measure our age as a company, uh, BG and after G or AG. So before Greg and after Greg, but uh, Jenny, tell us, tell us where you're from and give us an anecdote or two about your upbringing. Okay. So I'm originally English uh, or from England and I have lived also pretty much like Dominique before I was 11, we had lived in five different countries. Um, and I was sent off to boarding school in England from my very nice existence in Australia. I went to bleak, miserable, gray England um, <laughs> to an all girls school where I spent seven years in Seven Oaks. Um, but I had before then lived in, in Kenya and Ghana from an African perspective. I now live in South Africa. I've lived in the British Virgin Islands, Japan, um, and Australia, and then obviously England. So very, like I said in the last, um, what I say all the time, it was a very privileged upbringing. My dad was a banker, um, and we traveled the world. But the downside was boarding school. Um, the upside was I met a lot of people and I um, saw a lot of the world um, and learned a lot about different cultures, particularly living in places like Japan, which was such vast contrast from, so we moved from Japan to Kenya, which was quite a, quite a, a change. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So I moved down here, I went to live in Kenya, met my husband and we moved down here and we have been here since 1995 and we basically called South Africa home. South Africa is home. So my son, our son is South African. He was born here. Um, and that's really what we, what we, where we live. Um, and I've worked with SAPIX now. We realize today it's been 24 years wow. that we have been managing the SAPIX annual conference. This is the first time in all that time that we haven't had the conference. It would normally be this time of year. So there's like this gaping void in, in my life at the moment. And I don't know whether to miss it or to be glad it's not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of people are feeling that as well. <laughs> Greg, I feel so inadequate uh, in terms of my lack of international travels. I mean, I'm very jealous of the backgrounds we have here uh, and, and some of the, the cultural transitions that Jenny was alluding to and how to navigate those at an early age, what a great advantage, and, and to enjoy them yeah. and experience them, you know? Um, so very jealous over here, Jenny. Um, so Greg, yeah. let's dive more into the organizations themselves. Yeah, I got a couple questions I have to ask first, okay? Um, um, the Dutch are, are well known for having a lot of language skills, and as you've lived in so many countries, I have to ask, you have to you have to speak Dutch, English, and Spanish. Is there anything else that you? No, uh, well, yeah. Well, I'm fluent in those three for sure. Uh, and over the years, you know, I, I've uh, dabbled in French and Portuguese, um, but not not fluent. That's for sure. So, um, <laughs> this is a common joke in Europe. Do you know what you call somebody who's only speaks one language and and doesn't own a passport? Yeah, that's an American. <laughs> very good. <laughs> oh, guilty. Uh, I didn't know okay. that one. That's very good. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, yeah, so let's do, let's talk about your organizations. Wow, what an opportunity to be world traveled and at such early ages because it really imprints um, mm -hmm. the, the value of 
diversity and and breadth of knowledge and a, a global perspective on you. So it's interesting um, that you continue that in the work that you do. So um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with Dominique. Let's start with okay. you and talk about um, you know what your organization is all about. Sure, of course. Um, <clears throat> So let's, say, let's start with People That Deliver was established in 2011. Um, there was a, a World uh, Health Organization conference, uh, specifically um, bringing together sort of actors uh, that had seen the need to invest in, in the health supply chain workforce, because um, they saw that there was this huge gap, investments were not being made. Um, hmm. We didn't ha really have the skilled and qualified personnel to do this work in Africa. And so it was at this conference in 2011 where sort of 79 institutions came together and said, we're gonna pledge our support and our action um, to strengthen the capacity of the health supply chain workforce. But not just that, but also to promote the professionalization of the supply chain role in the health system. We don't, you know, before that, um, the, the supply chain, um, you know, is, you know, it's, they saw it as important, but not really that important. The investments were not being made. And so it's, it was from that point on that, uh, that People That Deliver was established. Um, so it's really sort of based on the premise that if you don't have the right people with the right skills running supply chains, that is sort of supported um, by appropriate human resource uh, systems, you know, we don't have well-functioning supply chains. And so, over the course of, of say, the ni last nine, 10 years now, uh, we've moved from being a very heavy sort of global advocacy initiative to now being the technical leader in human resources for health supply chain management. Um, and we do, this, we do this by advocating for a systematic approach to interventions in human resources. Uh, basically, these are there to sort of improve the demand and the supply for qualified professionals. And then we have, um, over time, we've developed one goal, and that really is to create a competent, supported, and adequately staffed supply chain workforce that's deployed across both the public and the private sectors, because um, it's really not just only the public sector that runs the health system in most of these countries, private sector has become increasingly important. Um, I did want to mention that sort of our unique feature is that uh, that our member countries and organizations, um, they are sort of what we call the vehicles that provide the services and funding. Um, so we're just, um, we're a small initiative, a small secretariat, uh, but we are sort of dependent uh, of our uh, coalition organizations to be uh, those that are providing the services and funding. And so we then build on that experience uh, to advocate for change at the global and the country level. Um, and that really results in a stronger and more sustainable system for developing, recruiting, and then also retaining qualified uh, supply chain workforce. Um, so we, um, we're, um, uh, we're a coalition. Right now there's 21 different uh, organizations that are part of, of uh, People That Deliver, uh, of which, you know, SAFIX is, uh, is one of the organizations. Uh, and Jenny and I work together for quite a few years now, really closely. And we really depend on SAFIX to, to uh, reach our, our community and, and, and build on, on, on the strengths that we've, that we've developed over the years. So, um, you're, yeah. so okay. you're dealing with the governmental agencies, but also professional supply chain organizations mm -hmm. as well to kind of bring all that together? That's correct, yeah. We have uh, seven different constituencies that are part of our, our group, and, and that includes governments, um, uh, professional associations, but also, you know, academic institutions and uh, okay. uh, private sector, um, you know, the, the big universities are part of us as well. Um, it, and of course, the aid agencies and donors as well. So Is it, is it yeah. an operations initiative, an enablement initiative? I mean, are you... It's, it's more enablement, I would say, okay. than operations. Yeah, we're not we're not supposed to be what we call implementing anything. We're supposed to be giving uh, sort of private. Uh, sorry, not private. Uh, we're supposed to be giving sort of uh, you know the resources, the tools to help um, organizations build the workforce in country. Got 
I wanted to mention as well that, you know, our, we have a home within UNICEF, you know, the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, which is responsible for providing um, humanitarian development aid to children worldwide. Hmm. And within UNICEF, we're part of the supply chain strengthening center, uh, where I have colleagues that work to do sort of strengthen the national supply chains uh, for vaccines and nutrition in most countries. Um, and of course, right now during this uh, pandemic, they are uh, working really hard to build resilient national systems to to be able to come back even stronger. Yeah, I just want to mention that as well. Yeah, if, yeah if, and this if, is a good time for that to right. uh, to retool and recognize mm -hmm. you know weak spots and opportunities for improvement. So fantastic. And if our listeners yeah. are tired of hearing the word the word resiliency. <laughs> They better buckle in because next few months, if not next few years, years it's going to be yeah. really all about making our global supply chains resilient. And and that word is very yeah. accurate for that. It yeah. is very much. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that's that's a great cause. Um, I feel like we we could use some of that enablement here. I mean, that's really a universal cause. Obviously, you know, highly needed in Africa and incredibly valuable to be able to get healthcare supplies and and uh, whatnot to the to the population there and to help some of these um, organizations and governments to be more effective in doing that um, all right so Jenny so tell us a little bit maybe about how you work with Dominique and also you know what what SAPIX is all about and and um, you know, despite your name, it is a total Africa effort, right? So share a little bit of that with us. We thanks, Greg. We um we we've been around for sixty years, so um, I think is it sixty? It's a long time. Well before your time, so how could <laughs> well you before my time, years before my time. Thank you. <laughs> Decades. Um, <laughs> Decades, and I've actually been involved with SAPIX, like I was saying, for over 24 years. Um, but only in, since about 2004 on the actual whole of SAPIX. So mm -hmm. understanding the value and actually understanding supply chain management and the importance of it. And also the importance of it as a recognized profession. And that's really what SAPIX now has evolved into is a organization that wants to lobby almost i hate that word and i don't mean it from a political point of view but just right. to get support from the rest of the community and from the industries um, that all have their own supply chains to recognize supply chain professionals for the valuable work that they do and to understand that supply chain supply chain management if done effectively can be hugely beneficial to your organization's bottom line and ultimately to global economies. Right. Um, and I think that that you know every every dark cloud has a single silver lining and hopefully this this will be the silver lining of the COVID-19 crisis is that supply chain management is being talked about and people are wanting to understand what it is. Um, it's no longer right. the kind of the, so what do you do? You know, with supply chain management, you know what that is. And then they go and talk to somebody else because then you're really very boring. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's really, that's our, that's our mission. And our mission is to gather like-minded people together. And originally it all started in South Africa. Um, and that's really where our core focus has been. But gradually it became more and more important and obvious that we needed to get involved with other countries on the continent. And that's one of the things that also we, you have to keep getting that message across is that Africa is just not one country. Right. Africa is made up of, as we know from the quiz yesterday. Yes, from yesterday, exactly. 54 different and very different countries that right. have different cultures, different languages different challenges, different supply chain challenges. And so it's, it's understanding that no one country on the continent has all the answers and that we yeah. have to learn from each other. And back in when, but when uh, People That Deliver was being founded or even before it was, we had a meeting with some people who came because they wanted warehouse management training. And um, 
it, it was that conversation, why would you come to us? Because we deal just with private sector. What would public sector want to know about private sector? And they felt the same, you know, we're public sector, we don't need to know about private sector. And that was years and years and years ago. And really we've never, we've never crossed the line. Um, and now from, thanks to, I think, the public health sector, the conversation is becoming louder and louder and louder that supply chain management is supply chain management. It doesn't matter whether it's public sector or private sector. It has to be done professionally. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the message. And so um, I, I, I came, Dominique contacted me and people that deliver have always had a vision that associations are brilliant community builders. And why do associations all work in silos? And she was speaking my language and talking about how we need to be able to educate people and we need to be able to build a community. And that community needs to cross over from all industries and also from private, private and public sector. So immediately we realized that this was a, an organization that we really wanted to be involved with. Um, and, and so we are on board um, and we have been actively involved and we are currently involved in a, in a project that is specifically around professionalizing supply chain management. Love it. Um, yeah, How long has that been, that partnership been, been in place again, Jenny? Um, since Sudan, has it four years? Four okay. years. Yeah, we met at the end of 2017, right? And then yeah. 2018, she yeah. came and yeah, joined yeah. us at a board meeting that we had in Benin. Yes. So that's when we solidified it. Awesome. Yeah. That's a, those are both really, both of you have really fascinating perspectives. And one, one part of that we've seen play out, and that is this notion that private and, and public have different needs. They certainly have different methodologies, right? Mm -hmm. But, but uh, again, a professional supply chain is, is still required in both places. We've seen it. And I think this is something we need to tackle as supply chain professionals. We've seen it even greater silos within. We got a question the other day, do you guys talk about supply chain or do you talk about manufacturing? Mm -hmm. And we've heard people say, Hey, we're in procure procurement. That's not really supply chain. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I think of supply chain as the umbrella under which the movement, the placement, the, uh, the purchasing and sale of goods, everything under that kind of falls under that umbrella. I wonder what you all's perspective on that oh, yeah. is. I completely agree because we always have to educate people on this and we talk about end to end supply chain. So um, when I talk about the health supply chain workforce, I talk about procurement specialists are part of that but also at the last mile where we're doing the distribution so the transportation personnel so it's really it's quite a, a large gamut of, of different uh, um, pieces yes. that are part of this and different and different workers yes yeah very holistic uh, circular when, when, these days. when we first started out we were so gung-ho to promote Sapix and the Sapix brand and everybody must know what Sapix is and then we realized that they don't even understand what supply chain management is. Yeah. So our, our narrative has changed um, hugely in, in the last, I'd say in the last five years, where yeah. we realized that we've been selling something, not selling, but we've been promoting something that people don't understand what they're a part of. Right, right. Um, and I think, that, I think that it goes back to the conversations of the perennial question should I do SIPs or should I do Apex? It's the same thing. It's like, it, it, it depends on what your skill is, what your interest is. One doesn't yeah. exclude the other to the point that we all have to, we all have to work together in, in all of this to make a true supply chain effective. Yep. All right. So let's, yeah. shift, let's shift gears a little bit here. Uh, there's lots of good news despite the current environment, if you look for it. And, and two of the pieces of good news that, that we have talked a lot about in recent weeks is number one, to, to both of your points, is that the global supply chain profession has got not only a seat at the table, which we've seen for the last couple of years, but is more visible and is on the tips of tongues of consumers that have never 
utter the words more than perhaps ever before. And that's great for the profession. It's great for bringing top talent in. It's great for moving the industry forward, many other things. Secondly, is um, as we've heard from a variety of guests, as we've learned and experienced ourselves, there's gonna be a ton of real meaningful innovation, action-oriented innovation, that's also gonna be moving the industry forward and, and really global business forward uh, because of the pandemic and because of some of these other um, associated challenges in recent, recent months and weeks. And that's, that needs to happen, number one. But number two, that, you know, um, it's one thing to struggle and it's one thing to get, you know, punched, knocked out by Mike Tyson and, and, and fall to the mat, but then get back up and, and, and be in position to, to serve the consumer and conserve uh, and serve the global business community better than ever before. And that's what we're, I believe we're going to be seeing. So with that said, and Dominique, I want to start with mm -hmm. you. You're, okay. If you had to point to one single biggest lesson learned from the pandemic, and it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be supply chain, it could be broader business, but what would that be for you? Well, I do, I do want to go to the supply chain. Um, cause, cause as you know, it, you know, it, I've always known the supply chain was important. You know, it's supply chains. I, I, for a long time, I've been advocating that it's a key enabler for all health programs. So really making those health programs possible in most countries, because you need with this, all the supplies that come in. Um, but, you know, this was really reiterated by um, Tedros, Dr. Tedros, who's the director general for the World Health Organization. In one of his media briefings, briefings sorry, in, in April, he said that the supply chain may need to cover more than 30% of the world's needs right now. And, you know, and that just says a lot to me. It's right there. The, the supply chain is now at the forefront. It is more evident than ever before. Um, you know, it, it, we, you may have heard um, the slogan we often use in, 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 our, in our work is no product, no program. Well, that's just, that's right now, that's the situation. Mm. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has put increasing pressure on, on health supply chains, and we now need more than ever be able to prevent and detect and respond to shortages. Um, and of course, we know as well that the movement of goods across global supply chains has also been disrupted, um, both in, you know, with flights being canceled, uh, mm -hmm. container ships not being able to move, and then transportation in country, uh, borders being closed. And so, you know, the operating uh, environment is just very, very complex. Um, so just that, you know, the, I guess the one thing for me is that it's just directly relevant to my work, that as the, the pandemic continues to disrupt supply chains across the globe, uh, it is more now, more now more than ever that we need to really stand behind the, the supply chain workforce. And, well said. Uh, what, what we've been sort of advocating, um, and I just recently wrote a brief on this, is that uh, we need to see them as essential health workers. You know, we, we talk about um, our nurses and, and those that are at the front line and our doctors, uh, but the, these, these, health, these, these the health supply chain workforce uh, are, are the ones that are going to be providing um, the vaccine or the treatment when it becomes available. So we need them to be able to, we need them there, we need to safeguard them. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's the one thing that I've learned through this very much. Hey, Dominique, you're, you're fitting yeah. right in as expected. I mean, we, we've been, we, we share that. I mean, so much of what you just shared there, I, I take is very inspirational and very invigorating and yeah. our industry needs to hear it because they are all, so many components of global supply chain is on a noble mission. And this whole notion of no product, no program that yeah. should really speak and tug on heartstrings because that is the role that supply chain plays. And we've touted for months about the need to, of course, we love on our medical professionals. There's so much bravery and, cur mm -hmm. and courage, st uh, courageous stories there. But man, the supply chain workforce has kept things moving. And it, w whether, as Greg likes to point out, the folks at the registers that are, that are perhaps at most, um, at, the, at highest risk, right? Because they're interacting with all these folks in close quarters or yeah. pickers or packers and fulfillment centers or you name it, truck drivers, you name it. So I love what you shared there. Jenny, I want to pose the same question to you. When you think of, and, and then we're, as we talked about pre-show, we're all chomping at a bit. We hear it from our audience all the time of ready to kind of break through into the aftermath is what Gartner's referring to the new normal, which is, is less of a cliche than the words new normal perhaps. But what's the 
your single biggest lesson learned from the pandemic? Um, that community is vital. So that it's, it's as simple as that. I've always been a people person. I'm, I've never been an academic. And I think um, that, that for me, that just this sheer example of the strength of the community that we've spent so long building and watching how people have pulled together to support each other, but also to share their experiences, their skills, their knowledge, it's been outstanding. And I think that that's, you know, every, every war, every, every emergency, every crisis, that's the first thing people say. Um, and this for me has been so rewarding, almost like realizing, not realizing a life's work, that sounds a bit dramatic, but it is, it is almost that because right. the relationships that we've been building for the last however many years, We've been able to pick up a phone and say, so and so, could you please help such and such? And the connections that we've been able to make have, have, have potentially been, been life-saving, money-saving, all sorts of different things. So that for me has definitely been the, the, the real sort of bright light spotlight of the whole thing and the, and the lesson that I've learned. Love that. Uh, you got to dig. I, I cannot I always forget who this quote is attributed to, but you got to dig your well before you're thirsty and build and invest in your network before you, uh, you know, ever need those relationships because during these challenging times, that's when they really can, can uh, show the value and, and keep things moving. Greg, I know we want to uh, switch gears a little bit here. Yeah. Um, uh, um, although that's a pretty poignant discussion. So I need to absorb that for a second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, dig your well before you're thirsty. I know was said in a Harvey McKay book. Yes, it, that's what it was the title of a Harvey McKay book. Thank you. Swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. You're as good as Malcolm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I never even went to Malcolm. How about that? Uh, though he, Malcolm might prove me wrong. Um, <laughs> it might have been said before that. Yeah, so um, let's talk about, um, you all have such a, an incredible grasp on where the supply chain is and where it needs to be going. So I'd love to hear, you know, if you, Scott loves to say, if you, if you look into your crystal ball, where, what is a topic maybe for now or maybe into the future that has your attention the most right now, Dominique, let's start with you. So tell me something that has your attention right now. And maybe it's not even supply chain, mm -hmm. but that you're kind of tracking right now. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, we talked, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, private sector and public sector earlier. And I think what I am tracking right now is um, uh, as we are starting to merge those two within the health supply chains in, in Africa, we're seeing that we need to uh, bring to light sort of the building capacity and new skills Mm. Um, specifically when it comes to outsourcing and contracting uh, con so contracts between public and private sector um, operators. So that's a really big thing that I've been looking at. Um, but there's also sort of, we need to build capacity in, in data science and analytics, um, as well as sort of monitoring supply chain performance. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly sort of trying to figure out um, what are the different uh, courses that are being taught in this and where do we actually need to build new content as well and how can we sort of advocate for that. So that's sort of more of, on a sort of professional note as to what I'm tracking, but and of course on a, on, a, on a personal note, very much looking at the development of a vaccine and, and the implications of that, of course, on the global supply chain, because once, um, we know there's one available, you know, how do you make it equitable so that everybody can access it? How do you ramp up uh, manufacturing as fast as possible? So those are things that are, that are, that are keeping me awake, <laughs> let's just say. Yeah, those are, those are a couple of really big things. One, I can help with, not the vaccine. <laughs> um, and that is we need to connect you uh, with Dr. Jennifer Priestley, who's one of the premier data scientists um, in the country. And um, and has uh, done some focus on on using that for supply chain because data is really mm -hmm. what is transforming supply chain now. A lot of the techniques that we use in supply chain, a lot of the core 
foundations that we use in supply chain are presumptive on a lack of sufficient data. And now that there is more access and more sufficient data, um, we're going to have a big transformation in how we manage supply chain going forward, undoubtedly. So yeah. thank you. All right, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Look into education. your crystal ball. Mm -hmm. Education, education. How do we... How do we make it so that when an operational, a crisis that requires operational um, capacity, it doesn't infringe on the pipeline of education, that budgets don't get cut, that the importance of the ongoing education is not ignored. And that's at all levels. It's not just at executive level. In fact, it's, it's almost as important, or it is more important perhaps, from the, 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 the workforce. Yeah. Um, they, they, they need to be continually have the opportunity for good education that is practical as well as theoretical. Yeah. Um, and all too, all too soon you see that courses are cut and it's the courses for the, the, the low level worker who is actually the person who's gonna get the goods from A to B. And if they're not educated and they don't understand safety and they don't understand those important things, then that's when accidents happen. And that's where goods don't get to where they've got to be because they don't understand the importance of what it is that they're doing and how vital a component they are in the supply chain. Yeah. So for me, education at the very the very most basic level not bells and whistles just the, the to get everyone understanding from a decision making perspective that ongoing education is vital it is absolutely vital so that's that's from that point of view and what what keeps me awake at night is how are we ever going to be able to fly again to see to reconnect with family that's my that's what I'm tracking I'm tracking the flights I'm I'm aghast that there are so many airplanes going in so many different directions and, and places but um, it's also when when will borders be open and it'll be safe for us to to reconnect with our families yeah yeah when that's... do I get to see you in person again Jenny exactly. yeah right you can't drive to South Africa from here unfortunately and a boat takes a long time I've looked. <laughs> so speaking of, uh, so the next two topics we, we want to tackle kind of the second half of the interview, we, uh, Jenny, we're going to uh, pick your brain a bit and, and get also Dominic's comments around uh, the need to really make sure African supply chain initiatives in that community is more visible. So we'll dive into that next. And then uh, we want to pick your brains more on diversity and offer some best practices or some, some, uh, uh, ideas for enhancing those programs for other, other organizations. We'll touch on that momentarily, but Greg, let's talk about the need to, you know, we've been, I've been learning ever since I connected with Jenny in Chicago a few years ago, uh, and Safepix really, and shame on me, hit my radar. You know, I've constantly been learning about, uh, what the, all the really neat things going on in the, on the African continent from a business standpoint, just from yeah. a, a uh, community standpoint, but certainly from a supply chain standpoint, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting to, to understand. And I think it's important, as you said before, to understand that Africa is not a country. I hear that so often. I think in the States, we often talk about Europe as, mm -hmm. as if it's a country. Now, you know, they have the European Union, but I've worked a lot in Europe and I can assure you that it is anything but unified. Um, and, and I think that people need to have that perspective. So, um, you know, tell us a little bit about, about the need for this visibility across Africa and, and what you feel like it can do, um, for the organizations, for the countries, for the people, the community, right? Mm -hmm. and there's, a, there's a hashtag that's doing the rounds, which is Africa responds. Um, and I think that that, that for me resonates because there is such an unutilized or unrecognized um, factor that in Africa and in all countries in Africa, there are individuals who have supreme 
skills mm -hmm. and supreme education and they are totally capable of of changing the world we've seen it we know we've seen we've seen it happen yeah. but so often in africa we look east we look west for solutions and and there's that thing you know look east look west home is best and and we have to as as africans and i'll i know i'm a sort of adopted one i guess um but but we have to we have to be able to create the things we need here um in our own country um and this mm -hmm. is something that a colleague a mutual colleague of dominique and, and mine azuka Keki, who who is in nigeria and she was doing a webinar and she talked about uh, three percent of medicines and commodities are manufactured on the continent three percent so that means that the rest are brought in from overseas now imagine right now the excruciating additional expense time lags all of that right. that are being experienced at the moment and surely we have the capability of being able to do this ourselves on the continent um, and i think that this is something that more and more and more africans are becoming more passionate about um, and i believe that that's got to be a significant change yeah, that's not a dissimilar problem with South America, where a lot of goods are imported and they've started to tackle some of that and they're facing some of the same issues that you are. But Africa is such a vast continent with enormous countries like Nigeria, which we also learned about their population and others that are not nearly as big in terms of population. And, and you have a, a broad array of sophistication in terms of government and infrastructure and yeah. and industry right so um, some sort of effort to kind of pull that all together and share that right across communities is is an important um mm -hmm. you know it's an important initiative so and and i know that's part i think uh, Dominique, I think that's a, a mm -hmm. part of what how you are working with Africa, but also how you're working with SAPEX to help try to um, create a, I don't know, a broader initiative across the continent. Continent. Yeah, we just, have to be careful to say continent, not country. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we want to make people aware of 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 these issues, and I was going to mention the same thing that 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 Jenny just did in that. You know, I think it's really an opportunity for African countries right now, this um, focusing on the strategic expansion of their local pharmaceutical manufacturing markets, sort of both for internal and uh, consumption, of course, and for export. And my hope is there that, you know, the, the African Union has uh, set up the African Medicine Agency, AMA. Um, it just needs to be ratified by all African countries. But once that is in place, you will have a regulatory body can then regulate medicines and medical products and technologies that these manufacturers may be able to produce. And then we could really see, um, you know, Africa sort of expand on this and not be so dependent on, on imports of pharmaceuticals because it's just that dependency is horrific right now. I was just reading um, a World Bank um, um, a, a newsletter yesterday and it said that the, they might, you know, hit the very first recession in 25 years mm -hmm. because of this pandemic. I guess the growth is going to decline severely between last year and this year. And I think that's just going to hit African economies tremendously. And so if they can start really, you know, thinking of sort of uh, more creative solutions, especially when it comes to manufacturing, I think that's going to be really helpful. And there, you know, Jenny and I can really help with... Um, with that, with you know the the health supply chain and logistics professionals, ensuring that that talent pool is there, and you know we're working, we're working on that. So I'm happy to are, be able to contribute to that. <laughs> are there other? I know. I know it's beneficial to get help from more established supply chains. Are there initiatives that you all are working on that that include people from the east or the west? right um n not just observing what's going on there but people actually getting engaged in africa to help with some of these initiatives 
so much so oh much <laughs> so 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 much and i think that that's one of the potentially one of the challenges as well um is that from a from a donor perspective there has been uh, a history of perhaps uh, too much in too few places and i think now with organizations like people that deliver right. um sort of helping to make these international organizations more aware of what's going in going on on the ground uh, and the different projects that are available organizations like the gates foundation usaid etc have got such a diversity in their in their uh, offerings um the people that they are funding the work that is being done um the, the help that's being given to various different areas that up until now have received very little funding there's a lot of work to be done um but you know for instance one of the one of the things that shocked me most was the 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 lack or not lack but the lack of spotlight on women and on reproductive health and these areas that um you know, women who live in areas of conflict who don't get any form of assistance. And, and this is where the, the, the donor organizations are playing such a great part in, in trying to um, create opportunity for organizations that are actively on the ground helping these, these situations improve. Mm. It's a slower process there, hey, Dominique? Yeah, <clears throat> we've, uh, you know, we know of many different donors uh, and, and initiatives that have been working to help improve the, the health supply chain uh, operations, et cetera, in, in Africa for over 25 years. And through our initiative, we're really trying to ensure that there's alignment between these investments being made because we see a lot of sort of siloed investments. Um, and so they do good in, in one area, but then perhaps they may disturb, mm. disrupt. Um, another area and so mm. just ensuring that that alignment happens and they we do get the sense that the donors do work much more closely and have been over the years especially and that was my experience with the HIV supply chain where we would see heavy investment being made by USAID and then the global fund uh, for TB, TB um, malaria and tuberculosis would come in and do their own thing but now they those those investments are aligned quite a bit mm. um, and then Gates Foundation has come in quite heavily over the last few years as well, making investments in, in building the workforce, the health supply chain workforce. And we're very happy with, with those investments, but again, they need to be aligned with other things that are happening at the same time. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's a delicate balance. I mean, you have to acknowledge the conditions on the ground along with your mandate to help. Yeah. And you have to adapt that mandate in, in 54 respective countries to be able to to be able to really help and um, understanding the environment that you're operating in is critical there. But also, as you said, spreading the wealth and spreading the knowledge as equally as you can becomes really, really critical as well. And hey, Jenny, can you decode conflict for us? So we hear that a lot in the States, but I don't think people know exactly what that means. Civil war. Yeah. You know, literally fighting. Um, I think I think that the you know the Ebola crisis has has certainly been a great education for me, not great in a good way, um, but but no, I have I've learned a huge amount of of what what goes on in a state of conflict, and how health and supply chain workers, um, you know, health workers and and supply chain essential workers are instrumentally affected by this because. For instance, you're working in a clinic, an Ebola clinic, you've got positive cases and the clinic gets attacked. Mm -hmm. And then all those people leave, they, they, they scatter. How do you then do your tracking and tracing? And how do, you, how do you then ensure that people keep up with their medication? All these, all these things that go on every day that are not just in Africa, it's all around the world. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's when you start looking at supply chains in the health space, the public health space, it, for me, 
because I'm not a supply chain practitioner, it's really started to help to make sense of it all because at the end of the day, it's a human life that's affected by it. Yeah, and, that, and that's the goal, right? I mean, supply chain doesn't end until the cure, the product, whatever is delivered. So, and that's, I think that's an awakening that we need in supply chain as well, is we have to recognize that the end consumer, if that's what you want to call it, of any, anything that we move through the supply chain is part of the supply chain. And we haven't done our job until we've reached them. So, mm. yep. All right. So we're going to shift gears from this very heavy topic here to another mm -hmm. heavy topic, important topic, critical topic. Uh, you know, our team has long held the belief that the global supply chain industry is going to lead us out of the pandemic into what's next. And, and by extension, we believe that the global supply chain community is also going to help the global business community tackle some of the, our most pressing challenges. And one of those is absolutely without a doubt diversity and making sure we're providing opportunities for all. I mean, you know, I don't, we don't have to share many numbers with our audience or with y'all because there's so many that show that, especially as you move up the totem pole, the proverbial totem pole into the upper levels of leadership, just how little uh, diversity is really uh, how it manifests itself, you know, uh, picking one de definition and d diversity is not just binary. It's not two things. It's not three things. It's a wealth of things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you just take one nugget, you know, just less than 10%. If you look at the fortune 500 C levels, uh, less than 10% are, 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 are females in that realm. And that's just, you got to change that. Um, we have other challenges that have uh, really surfaced in recent weeks. We've got to change. So, but for the sake of this discussion, let's really focus on diversity. Let's focus on um, the inarguable fact that, that healthy diversity levels within organizations have a bottom line impact. You know, McKinsey and many other well-respected organizations have, have provided exhaustive research to, to, to bear that out. So if you're, and, and Dominique, we'll start with you. If, if, you've, mm -hmm. if you had the ear of uh, CEOs around the world, that um, are already struggling with different components of culture and workforce and growth, you name it, give, it, give them some thoughts uh, around diversity and how to really become more meaningfully successful with their diversity approach. Yeah, of course. Um, again, this is, a, I think, is a very apropos question for the times we're living in. Um, so, but so as an international development professional, I have to say I've always worked in very diverse workplaces. Um, you know, currently at UNICEF, for instance, um, the department I work in, it's extremely diverse. We have staff with very, from very different, unique backgrounds, technical areas, but also you should see the number of different countries that are represented. Um, many different African countries, uh, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, etc., but also from the US, but from Japan as well, India, Korea, uh, Estonia, et cetera, it's, it's, uh, or even, and even Latin America, we have the Dominican Republic as well. It's, um, it's, it's quite tremendous. Of course, the, the, the gender balance there <laughs> is, is not as, as, as good as I would hope it to be, but I know they're working on that. Um, well, you know, yeah, and, and real yeah, quick, sorry. Dominique, I mean, mm. you know, this is a journey. You never reach a finish line when it comes to diversity or continuous improvement or anything else. Yeah. Uh, and if you can make strides in some areas while you still try to crack the code in others, you know, that, that's a big part of the solution here, right? Correct. That is very much. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think it's a, a diverse workplace um, is, is, can be very effective when you sort of allow employees, because I think I was going to say, because it really allows employees to be more uh, productive. So I think when you bring in many different people with different unique backgrounds and different technical areas and different countries, then there's a flow of, of ideas, right? That you don't get when it's sort of the same mindset. Um, and I think right. that flow of ideas is, is limitless. And so inside an office, I think people need to sort of let go of any biases they have and just worry about working together. Um, that's, I think there, that's the most important thing. Strengthen your team and, um, and work together as a team and, and make that, that flow of, of ideas work. Um, and then you become super productive. Mm. 
Well said. Jenny, what, what would you, if, again, if you had the ear of CEOs around the world and, and we're- Which you do, probably, yeah, right. as a COO, yeah. right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Greg, thank you. Um, what would you share along the lines of, of more meaningful, successful diversity approaches? Okay, so am I allowed to say it? Together, everyone achieves more. There we go. Um, you have think, to say it in every single time we talk to. You every to. single time. Because everybody brings something different to the table. And, 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 and that's what we've got to do. And I think that I think above everything, we just have to think. We have to think before we act. We have to think before we invite. We have to think before we do something as simple, not that it's simple, but putting together a conference program, um, putting together, and I, I can hear Deborah Dull and Sherry you mm -hmm. know, in my head Manals. talking about get rid of the mammal. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, but it, but it is that. It is that. It's that subconscious chipping away at you not in a not in a, a negative way, but just in a chipping away any form of uh, lack of thought. Um, and I think we're all we've all been before this. We've all been in such a rush just to get the job done that we've not necessarily thought: Have we brought the best people with the right skills? Um, and 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 I think that that's definitely something that we all need to try a little bit harder to to do. And I mean, you know, I live in a country where it is top of mind and it is something that we every day have to think twice about um, right. and that, that people are exceptionally sensitive to, not as sensitive as they should be um, and not enough progress or in, in, in a way is being made. But we do live in a, in a society where people are allowed to be who they want to be much more so than, than some countries in Africa. Um, and I think that, that, that we've got a long way to go, but I do think that, again, it goes back to education. You know, education is the, is the root of, of, of everything. Um, and, and without it, people will forever be lacking in being able to make a change to any form of diversity. Yeah. And, you know, part of education and a big part of education is the awareness of that there is a challenge and, the, and, and, and not just related to diversity, but many other issues. And, you know, uh, one of the roles we take very seriously here at Supply Chain Now is, is serving as a vessel for that awareness and, and helping to facilitate the dialogue and the learning experiences and, and those, exchange, those critical exchanges of perspective that have to take place in order for the industry and for the business community to get better and meaningfully, not lip service. I'll tell you, Greg, we've talked about that this notion of lip service for a couple of years now, and, and we've mm -hmm. done so very playfully, right? But it's very real now. We've got mm -hmm. to have a bias for action, you know, more so now than ever before. So Jenny, I appreciate your focus today in particular on education because it's, it is so critically important and it might sound cliche to some, but, um, we've got to learn from each other. We've got to learn from best practices. We've got to learn from past mistakes so that we can apply it and, and move move the whole community forward. Greg, uh, before we wrap, and, and, and Dominique and Jenny, this is, is as enlightening of a conversation that I thought it would be uh, as I better understood, especially Dominique, since you know, we're new to each other and I started to appreciate your background. Y'all are one heck of a one-two combo here and we, we need to bolster <laughs> a couple more hours to this. But as we start to wrap, Greg, and before yeah. we ask them for, for, you know, make sure our listeners can get in touch, what, what really stands out to you in this whole diversity conversation that we're, we're concluding the interview on? So I think um, some, the very first thing that Dominique said uh, prompted this um, thought response in me, and that is she has had the blessing of a, of a diverse upbringing and worked in diverse workplaces. And I think about that, um, you know, myself having a multicultural family from birth and, um, and, and I think one of the things, and also having had the same kind of experience in working in diverse workplaces. And it made me think it's really hard for me to fathom that it, it's, that much worse than what I've experienced, but you really have to acknowledge that. And you have to acknowledge that your circumstance, if particularly good, 
might be highly exceptional and mm -hmm. and you need to em engage with and embrace embrace sort of some of the I don't know, lesser, worse, whatever you want to call it, type of working um, life environments, and and acknowledge and and um, and sort of drink that in to figure out what the problem really is. Because I haven't experienced it in the same level as other people. I, I, maybe not in the same level, but in the same way. I've experienced it from both sides. My people were immigrants to the country we emigrated from and to the states. So. Um, and, and yet I'm a white guy, right? So I don't even have the same problems that a lot of the people in my family have had. So, but still, I think you have to kind of, um, understand the difficulties that are really being experienced if you haven't experienced it yourself Yeah. and then use what is great about having that diverse experience to fix what is wrong with those non-diverse, non-fair um, sort of environments. Yeah. So Sorry, that was kind of a roundabout way yeah. of getting there. But I, I mean, I think it, it actually makes the, the perspective more difficult if, if diversity is a part of who you are, than if it's not, it's so easy to recognize yep. if it mm -hmm. hits you in the face all the time. So, so we're going to wrap the interview here and, and, and Dominique and Jenny in a moment, we're going to ask you, we'd love for you to make kind of issue a challenge to our audience I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball issue a challenge especially given these unique times and then secondly let's make sure folks know how to um, connect with you both he and your organizations yeah you know here, because because he's not getting to watch baseball here comes the curveball so. um, but you know here here's my challenge and 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 look I am pointing at myself more so than anyone else, but, but, you know, in this, in this quarantine era in the last two, three months, we've all, most of us have lived in, um, it's easy to dive into maybe double down on social media and it's easy to take surface level discussions and, um, uh, misconceptions and buy into some of the inaccuracies out there. My challenge to audience and my challenge to my own family is to, is to go out and have meaningful discourse whether it's picking up the phone, whether it's as you get back, you can have a cup of coffee six feet away and really seek to empathize with, it's not, a, it's not us versus them. There, there are so many different facets, this, this conversation and the challenges we're experiencing. Seek you first to understand and, and really under, and understand what we're facing, whether um, no, no matter where, what side, what, you know, angle of this, um, of this table you're on, but, but get out, can make a connection learn and, and become more aware of what many many folks are struggling with and, and are being challenged with and then you'll be much more better prepared to to help us as an industry move ahead all right so uh dominique we'll start with you uh give us a quick challenge and then let's make sure folks can connect with i love the name of your organization by the way people that deliver i love that thank you thank you um my challenge would be just to educate yourself really delve into the science and, and read up on on what's being developed so that you really get a, to come to grips of, as to what um when it comes to va the the vaccine development when it comes to the new treatments like really delve into what is being done rather than just hearsay quick snippets on media it's just it's that's not all the information that's out there but there's so much more in in the science that's being developed right now so so take a look at that great point and so and how can folks uh, oh, jump into the, the we want to make sure that folks okay, we almost forgot <laughs> <laughs> they know how to support excuse me <laughs> reach you and support the organization I yeah, got yeah. It. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you want to uh, learn more about us, uh, we have a website, it's www.peoplethatdeliver.org. Uh, lots of information on there and lots of resources and tools. Um, of course, we're also on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, uh, very active on that. And actually we have a webinar next week. Outstanding. Um, yeah. Tell webinar we're doing together with an organization called Comonics International. Um, and we're highlighting the health supply chain workforce as essential workers. We'll have um, examples from uh, countries like Liberia, Mozambique, and actually um, uh, Jenny's uh, partner, ASCM, is also going to be presenting. Outstanding. Great. 
Outstanding. And folks can find that at your website, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Also, if you follow us on, on LinkedIn and Twitter, you'll find more information on that. Dominique, we look forward to checking back in with you. What a great um, story. All the whole, the whole shebang was, was very informative, very intriguing and look forward to checking back in. Dominique Zwinkles, executive manager of people that deliver, which of course is allied with UNICEF organization. Okay, Jenny. I know, uh, hey, none of us are big fans of curveballs unless you do hit it out of the park. But, Jenny, you <laughs> always hit these curveballs out of the park. So, please issue your challenge, and then let's make sure folks uh, know how to connect with SAPIX. Um, so, the easy part first, to connect with SAPIX, it's www.sapics.org. And I am active on Twitter and other social media as well. Um, and my challenge is for people to think about how you can use and share your privilege mm. and whatever you decide that privilege is be it color be it education be it geography be it travel whatever privilege you have work out how you can share that to the best of the community well wow well, that's strong that's really powerful i mean i think um subconsciously people use their privilege for their own purposes, just apply it to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. If you're smarter or taller or whatever it is, right? Um, that's fan that is a fantastic challenge. Use yep. it for good. Agreed. Uh, use your privilege for good, but also Dominique's get dive deeper. You yeah. Know, don't just take a yeah. sound bite here, here, or a social media yeah. post here, really get informed and educated that we all, the whole conversation mm -hmm. gets better. Yeah. When that happens. Okay. So Greg, why don't you, as we wrap, of course, we got to give you a chance to issue a challenge. So what would that be as we conclude today's episode? Wow. After those two challenges, that's, um, <laughs> that's really tough, but, um, you know, I, I think, I think it is, um, give more, you, you know, you mentioned it, right. Seeky first to understand. Um, I would challenge you as Stephen Covey challenged people in the seven habits of highly effective people begin with the end in mind. And by the end, I don't mean the end goal of whatever initiative you're thinking about. I mean, the end of, of your life. Imagine you observing your own funeral and listening to people talk about you and give your eulogy at your funeral. What words do you want said about you? And that is the best way I think to, to begin with the end in mind. You, if you use that as your goal, you will drive the right direction every single day. Love it. Outstanding, Greg, as always. All right, so big thanks again to our guest, Dominic Swinkles with People That Deliver. Jenny Froome, great to see you twice in one week. COO hey, of Safe. Two days. Uh, two days, back to back. Uh, yeah. Hey, a little Jenny, every day we all get better, for sure. That's so right, keeps the doctor ready. away. Uh, Kidding aside, I really enjoyed it. Always a pleasure. Love what you and your team are yeah. doing. And we will be uh, connecting back in with you real soon. Yeah. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Jenny. All right. Thank so, you, Scott. Thank you, Greg. You bet. Great to see you. Um, all right. So as we wrap up here today, Greg, we want to invite, you know, it's going to be a, um, a wild webinar or a wild summer full of webinars. It, it is. It's it? kind of current state. So, uh, yeah. Not only check out Dominique's webinar, we've got a, a neat one coming up on June 25th with the folks over at Rootstock. If you think about the challenges that many manufacturers are going to have when it comes to optimizing ERP performance, and, and really, by extension, just technology that makes manufacturing plants move forward, you still have well, folks uh, will be on some uh, in remote locations, yeah. uh, connectivity, all these challenges that are going to compound the environment we're in. Uh, so check out our June 25th webinar with uh, Tom Brennan over at Rootstock. You can go to supplychainnowradio.com to sign up for that free event. Greg, one last or word. LinkedIn or Twitter. We're yeah. everywhere. Social yeah, media. I mean, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Last word, Greg, before I sign off. Golly. Um, I don't know. This is just uh, so, uh, so powerful. And frankly, I'm really excited to hear about what's going on in Africa. We talk about virtually every other part of the world so frequently. And Africa is, if not the biggest, sorry, not much, not very good at geography. If not the biggest, one of the biggest continents. And as we know, 54 countries. So 
and in such need of uplifting. So it's good to see that there are initiatives, um, you know, to help help br- uplift the countries that need it. And I'm glad that that Jenny and Dominique are so aware of spreading the wealth and the knowledge throughout all of the continent. So that's Put. that's my big takeaway. Yeah, uh, a lot more successes that come out and from a, a, sp- a supply chain perspective and many others from all the good work that these organizations are up to uh, across Africa. All right, so to our audience, thanks so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed today's conversation, be sure to check us out and find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. On behalf of our entire team, hey, I know it's a challenging time for so many, but uh, working together, and it's a tired phrase, but that's what it's going to take to use uh, Jenny's acronym. Uh, Together, everyone achieves more. That's what it's going to take to move everyone forward. And rest assured, there are much brighter days in the months ahead for everybody. So on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.